Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Adoption Engagement Forum on Friday, the 17th of February, 2023. Uh, it's great to see you all here. As usual, I'll just start with the um, the usual reminder to, uh, if you're uh, new to the group or if you're watching the recording and you're, and you're new to the Open Active community, then please do join our Slack, uh, Slack workspace. It's a great place to keep up to date with everything that's going on with the initiative with all the the different community forums that uh, that are open for for people to join like the uh, adoption engagement forum which we're we're having today and then also the w3c community group which um, builds and maintains the open active standards um and it's also a great place to to interact with other members of the community and, and share things that you're working on and, and any challenges you might be facing. So yeah, please do join our, our Slack workspace and the, the links there are on the slide. And just to quickly look at what we've got on the agenda today. So we're really, um, really pleased to welcome Dave Gerrish from UK Active, who's going to be talking about some of the digital futures work that they have been doing um, as an organization. And then we've just got a couple of uh, quick updates on some some conferences and, and webinars that have happened in the last couple of weeks as well. So um, sh should be a really good agenda, hopefully. But we'll just um, start with, uh, if we could, with some quick introductions. So if we just go around and uh, quickly introduce ourselves, we've got a couple couple of new people to the group. So it'd be great, uh, great to get to know everyone. So if I could start with you, Charlie. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, Charlie Merrick Clark, uh, director, Playfinder and BookTech, um, a sports marketplace and booking system, and also representing from the um, steering committee. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Tom, if I could come to you next. Hi, everyone. Uh, Tom Marley here, co founder at Played, uh, create activity finders and have a booking platform. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Dom? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Dom. Uh, Dom Fanoff from I'm in. Uh, yeah, one of the co-founders, and we yeah, use open data and provide it to uh, different organisations to help people live more physically active lives. Thanks, Dom. Uh, Oli, if I could come to you next. Hi, I'm Oli from London Sport. We're one of the active partnerships. Thanks, Oli. Uh, Dave, if I could come to you next. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, David Gerrish from UK Active, strategic lead for digital. Uh, UK Active is the trade organisation for the fitness and leisure sector. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, Ross, if I could come to, come to you next, welcome to your, your first AEF meeting. Thank you, yep. Uh, Ross Gehring, originally from the UK. I've been uh, overseas 30 years and uh, just back last December in the UK. Um, I'm um, representing 101 Sports and in particular the Squash Players app which is a crowdsourcing method of gathering lots of venue data. Brilliant. Thanks, Ross. And, and Ross has kindly agreed to um, speak a little bit about his app at an uh, upcoming AEF in a few weeks' time. So be a good opportunity to find out more about, about your work then. Uh, Geraldine, if I could come to you next. Hi, good morning, everybody. So I'm Geraldine. I work for Yorkshire Sport Foundation. So we're one of the active partnerships covering South and West Yorkshire. Um, and I'm the Data and Insight Manager, so I'm covering Emma Gucci's maternity leave. So I've been, it's gone really quickly. I've now been here between three to four months. So yeah, time is flying. Yeah, absolutely. Hope, you, hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> I am absolutely loving it. Good stuff. Um, Andrew, if I could come to you next. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Andrew Newman. I'm the Principal Data Specialist at the Open Data Institute and uh, ODI's Project Lead for Open Active Delivery. Um, yeah, uh, I've been to the AEF once before, and I'm really looking forward to today's talks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Adam, you joined just in time. Yeah, hi, everyone. Sorry, sorry I'm a little bit late, but good to see you all. Um, yeah, I'm Adam Freeman Pask. I'm head of digital innovation at Sport England. So I'm on the Sport England side of projects like Open Act, Open Active and um, Digital Futures, which is the one that, um, and uh, the Digital Marketing Hub. Uh, so I sit on the funder side of those projects. But yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Adam. And uh, David? Try out, yeah, just joined as well, so I was running late. Um, I'm the Head of Communications at the ODI, so I look after all the, the comms outputs and the comms strategy for Open Active. Nice to see some different faces around today, so great to see some more people. Thanks, David. And uh, I, I often forget to 
I go around everyone and often forget to do myself at the end. So um, I'm Tim Corby and I'm an uh, engagement consultant at the ODI and I work on the um, Open Active as part of the um, ODI's contracted work with uh, Sport England as part of our work to steward the Open Active initiative. Cool. Um, so thanks everyone for that for those intros. Great to see a few new faces today and um, we'll get cracking straight on with the agenda. So um, up first, we've got Dave. I don't know if you're able to share your screen, Dave. Uh, yeah, we'll, give, we'll, give, we'll give it a go. Um, give it a go. I'll stop sharing and then it, you can. It, all right. Okay. Yeah. I, I can. Um, I can jump in and, and share the slides if yeah. it needs to be. Okay. So just bear with me two seconds. Where are we? Here we go. Have you got where it goes? Have you, um, yep. That's all come through. Center view. Is that showing as in one one slide and you don't see the busy bits by the side, do you? Uh, yeah. It looks like we've got the the slightly busy bits by the side as well, but um okay, let's start. Yeah, we'll just take out the presenter view. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you. Well, yeah, first and foremost, thank you very much indeed for the uh, the opportunity to speak to you and been delighted to be uh, be asked and myself and, and Adam, we work extremely close uh, on the digital uh, initiative uh, across the sector. Just give you a little bit of a, a back history. Um, UK Active uh, was brought in in 2019 to support uh, Open Active and Open Data Initiative uh, alongside Sport England as steering group members. Uh, it became very clear there were some challenges that we needed to, uh, to 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 overcome, and then obviously COVID hit us, and um, and then in twenty one, we uh, well through twenty we were designing a new methodology as to how we were going to support open active and open data and the, the overall digital transformation of the of the sector, and then in twenty one we launched Digital Futures, and we moved from steering group to being a community member in support of the initiative. So that's just a little bit of a, a back history for those organizations that uh, are familiar with, with us. There's a lot of slides here. The All the slides will be available to you post the session and please, by all means, use them in any uh, supporting work that you do. So um, I'm gonna run very quickly through them and then we'll have a bit of a and a at the end if you, if you wish. So let's just uh, crack on, so. So, Digital Futures, some of you may or may not be aware, but Digital Futures is a uh, is a multi-year programme uh, by UK Active in partnership with, uh, with Sport England. Uh, its overall aim is to improve how digital is harnessed within the leisure uh, sector to enhance consumer experiences as well as value to operators. Uh, we're also very fortunate to be working with a number of different organisations to help us with this against uh, strict uh, terms of reference, which uh, supports the overall sector, so there's no the view that it may be a commercial thing for them. It's, it's all about how we bring them together to support the sector going forward. And we've been working very extensively this last year with the Scottish Leisure Network. And we were very pleased last week to go up to Edinburgh and present the data to them. And also we have done to Sports Scotland and the Scottish Government. So we're looking to do some more mature work there next year as we lead into new consultation. Digital Futures is now into its second year. Uh, as I say, it's an operator consultation and it measures the sector's overall digital maturity and effectiveness through an online survey as well as uh, in-depth interviews. And as you can see, we've got a number of different strategic and core contributing partners within, within the group itself. So the consultation coverage last year. So we held the consultation July, August last year. We held what, the first one in 21 uh, and we included this year, twice the amount of operators than we did in 21, uh, covering when we broke it all down, 1,800 sites representing an estimated 4.5 million uh, members uh, nationwide, six and a half million, sorry, six and a half thousand data points. Uh, but we also benchmark against other sectors in order to show that it's not a false narrative that uh, we are here when in fact, in, real, uh, um, in realistic terms compared to other sectors, uh, we uh, we may be slightly off on something. So this year we have, as we did with last year, we looked at the Lloyds Bank uh, uh, business uh, maturity index uh, tools, as well as they have their consumer and they also have skills audits. So the first year we looked at COVID, this year we've looked at uh, digital skills, and then uh, we also looked with the Charity Skills Commission as uh, digital skills report as well. And this year we're looking, as we had a, a steering group meeting yesterday, 
what is going to be the next part of the program for our consultation this year that we're looking to benchmark against. Now, again, this would be a shout out to each and everyone here. If you feel that there are any reports uh, that would be of value to benchmark the digital transformation of the sector against, then please feel free to uh, to come through either myself, Adam or Tim, and, uh, and let's just discover that. So thank you very much if you could do that for me. So what do we do? So busy slide here. So we score the fitness and leisure operators for their digital maturity and effectiveness using, as I say, an, an ongoing benchmarkable measure, which enables overall sector. And then we break it down to segment and then we look for year on year comparisons. The definition of digital, which is millions of them out there, was defined by a working group. And this is how we've defined digital for the purpose of this particular program. The use of technology and data to meet the raised consumer expectations and drive innovation. As you can see, we go across capabilities and culture of organization, which you naturally would do when it comes down to digital transformation. We look obviously internally at the processes and systems that they use and how joined up they are to provide the insight. And then how they then use all those to provide the services and experiences either online or in venue um, to ensure we get a richer experience that uh, you know they've all come to expect with other sectors uh, and try and remove some of the challenge and obstacles that we, we have. We measure the sector across five distinct digital measures, uh, again, uh, signed off and designed by the Digital Futures uh, Steering Group. Uh, we measure over 40 individual measures, so we can drill down to exactly what's going, what's working and what needs to be worked upon um, for both individual operators, segments and segments as a whole. We also, as part of the process, as per, part of the quantum qual data analysis, we have the online tool, which I say is, is ongoing. It's available all year round. They can use it as many times as they want. It's not behind the paywall. We'll never be behind the paywall as long as I'm in this post uh, to provide the data and the insight. Um, but we also look for um, organizations to uh, ask, come forward for a more in-depth uh, interview of which we uh, we spend uh, an hour going through a question bank uh, across the C-suite to actually give us the balance and quantum qual. And we look across sector as well, independent, multi-franchise, public, private, and so on and so forth. So, so we're not skewing any of the, uh, the observation. So where are we? The overall score for the, so let me just put that a little bit more if it comes up here, yeah, that should be it there. So the overall score for the sector's digital maturity and effectiveness uh, this year is 50, 51%, falling from last year's uh, average of 55. The, uh, this means the sector is already making some advances in digital, but there still needs to be committed investment, as we all know, uh, to keep pace with them and responding to the growing consumer needs, which has just seemed to be racing away. The highest score was 85 and the lowest score was 10. 85 puts them into the digital leader percentile. We had one in 21 and we've had three this year. Um, and we also managed through our activities in Scotland to provide some data um, that is able to be communicated. So hence we presented um, the data last week and out of the 19 operators, we're still a small sample set, but we're starting now to get some, some data that we can use year on year. And they scored 46 overall. They have some unique challenges due to geography and um, bandwidth and, and so on and so forth, amongst other things. Obviously this year, the, the drop in figure was quite interesting. Um, as we will do this year on year, we're obviously start to get to a nuance where we, we get to a point where we have a benchmarkable standard that is replicable year on year to do some proper bench benchmarking. You all know as data scientists and what have you, you know, you just need to build the program to a certain point that you can actually say we are now at a point that we have a representative sample that we can use true year on benchmarking. But interestingly, when we um, interviewed the CEOs who said, hold on, we can, we got we, this last year and we're actually down this year, but on reflection, it comes it came about that they are actually now using the tool to analyze and respond to the questions in the more informed uh, knowledge based on the fact that they have done their own further education and upskilling and understanding of how digital support. So they're actually using this tool to criticize their business. Hence, we slightly got a little bit of a, a lower average. But also, we've had an increase in uh, local authorities and smaller one to three sites, which are less mature based on the fact that they tend to either be multi-skilling, multi-hats, multi-jobs, less resource internally. So again, they're less mature. So again, those things have a, have a factor. 
likewise post covid as well there was heavy reliance in the first year of still digital interventions and digital, digital experiences that's wavered as we move back into bricks and mortar um uh, but moving back to venues so again that was another possible reason why when we did the analysis going going forward the average the average score um this year is uh, is fallen um sl score slightly lower this year with performance and impact seeing the the lowest the lowest drop so you have a, you have access to all these as you would naturally expect, as we see here, we have public, private, university sector, and obviously the, we've got some data from the Scotland. Uh, we have the private sector um, operators scoring higher than public areas for, for public operators for all areas of digital, with university operators scoring still low. This year we had to we had through increased engagement, as I say, with Scottish Lens Network to be able to get some data there. So you see the minus. The minus is in relation to the overall UK. Uh, sorry, the England score and the deficit where they are in each of those particular categories, so we can then put together some working working practices. Uh, in addition to this year's 20, 2021 digital uh, maturity report, um, we are going to be potentially looking next year, and Adam may want to look at this, that we will extend, be extending the consultation into other organisations such as uh, NGBs, potentially active partnerships and some global work, again, to give us some comparisons with how we're doing across the whole physical activity ecosystem that consumer has. So it's not just bricks and mortar that they touch, they have other in, you know, touch points within. As you would, as you would naturally uh, see, the larger the organization with the multiple sites, the larger the team, the larger the insight, the larger the integrations that they have to provide the, uh, the data to support them designing their experiences. So naturally you would see a higher proportion of digital maturity across the, the, the larger, larger sites. It's up to us to take some of the learnings from those larger sites to see how we can then take that back into some of the small organizations to actually help with their upskilling as well. We had this year an interesting um, on the investigation. We started to see a the operators who participate in both years score higher on average. So we're calling these organizations the um, Digital Futures Cohort Group. Um, so as I say, despite overall the sector falling, these operators score higher on average across the, uh, the different categories. This suggests that playing an active role uh, in the Digital Futures program has helped operators increase their use of digital and amplify its positive effect uh, on, their, on, their, on their performance. And we will continue to do some deeper analysis as to what was the rationale and behind where they improved, what were the impacts, what were the drivers and so on and so forth. So that's going to be a focus as we move into 23-24. Not all digital futures, uh, sorry, here we go. On average, the score across the digital futures cohort group in all areas was consistently higher. So we saw in the first one, it was lower across overall. However, within the digital futures cohort group, we managed to see either equal or slightly increased levels of digital maturity across the, the five measures that we, that we did. Now we're just diving into a little bit more of the data. There's a lot here, but I'm going to skip through these very quickly, but you have them as part of the, the pack overall. So. We're now going to look at each of the individual areas of digital and pick out some of the key key findings here. Uh, in organisational model, there's been a rise in digital skills and investment in digital, and we've seen for the first time machine learning and uh, an AI be part of the um, of the offering within their digital ecosystems. Which they may have been in the first year, but those who participated, it just wasn't evident in this in this in the uh, information. However, we're still seeing a high proportion of operators say that at least some of their systems are, are holding them back, which I've highlighted there, which has been a focus of discussion over the last few weeks with um, Legend, Explore, Gladstone, and we're working closely with them in workshops, which we have with Sport England the other week as well on, on how we can actually overcome some of these. And interestingly, 42% don't have a digital strategy. And as we know, you can't have a roadmap, you can't progress unless you've actually got some way of measuring the effectiveness of it and, and giving you some direction as to where you go. So that still for us is a challenge um, in the fact that they still don't have a strategy that is either funded, resourced or robust enough to meet not just now, but the future needs in five to 10 years. So we wrote some papers to support that as part of the outcome of 21. In, in fact, just to go back there, if I can, cohort in the cohort uh, group, what we actually saw was they scored seven percentage points higher in this particular area with the key measures reflecting greater levels of digital progression. Uh, than the sector as as a whole. We've got some of the key highlights there of some of the things that uh, is is quite interesting to uh, to 
to dig deeper when you look at the overall report itself. So 58% actually are heavily invested in digital compared to 46. And again, rather than 85% saying they're holding back 81. And when you dig underneath that, they're actually pushing them and forming more strategic, intelligent customer relations with their, with their, with their providers. And as we can see down there, more have a digital strategy that um, it gives them a, a roadmap to measure the effectiveness of their, their program. So these are just some of the nuances we're seeing. Performance and impact, fewer claim that digital experiences play an important role um, for customers, uh, all that digital will play a critical role uh, in them going, going forward. So uh, again, this could be a post-COVID return to facilities may have impacted here. As they say, it's a slightly less important because they were heavily, as we know, reliant on in and out of venue uh, connectivity. When it comes down to digital, uh, digital Futures cohort group, they scored nine percentage points higher here, uh, attracting more digital revenue and operating savings than the sector as a whole, which when we have, according to McKinsey, 77% of digital transformation programs failing um, or, and then we have other reports which says that CEOs, high proportion of them feel in other sectors that digital transformation did fail to deliver the significant improvements, then having this gives confidence that when they're putting business cases forwards, um, that there's actually some ROI that's tangibly uh, accountable for, and that is then driven down through their, their, uh, their digital strategy. Data and insights this is the one you've all been waiting for here. So in data and insights, 52% say they, uh, they know the needs and expectations of their consumers, but only 15% say the same for their target non-customers. So again, there's some some more work which we're doing around consumer uh, research uh, at UK Active, as well as with the Digital Futures Cohort Group across their, their their members, as well as we will lean, be leaning on yourself to help provide some more of this particular data. 40% um, say they consume or publish open data and 23% are not even aware of it. Now we have to, this is no indictment at all. This is purely for the fact that we this was a UK consultation and uh, the boundaries of uh, open active uh, is of within the Sport England remit of UK, uh, sorry, within England. So we're going to all territories. So again, that might have skewed the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the score slightly there. But there is significant interest following our presentations last week to, to look at how open data can support. And, and it was asked that Sport Scotland, Sport in England work a little bit closer together in support of these types of initiatives. So that's something, again, we're taking, taking forward. However, within the Digital Futures Cohort Group, I'm pleased to say here that 50%, 58% say they consume or publish open data. So bear in mind, this is a snapshot of a, uh, a consultation. It's up to us now to actually draw out from here as to the, the ROIs they're getting, hence the reason why more of them are consuming versus the overall sector. What is that benefit? So that is going back to one of the remits that we had back in 2019 when we came to work with um, uh, the ODI and Sports England on Open Active is just a pull these pull these things forward digital experiences uh there's been a small rise in operators joining up experiences and the usability of them and 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 the effectiveness use of, uh, of social media however few uh, all of those participating this year say they're sending regular emails so a lot needs to be done with regards to the uh, the way in which we interact both in and out of venue and the way in which we're using technology such as AI and, and what have you to to do some automation on the way in which we we connect. We're also looking at supporting with SIMPS for some of the work that we're doing on digital skills as well in this particular area. As you say, 80 percent have an app versus 91. Everyone was getting an app during COVID. So there's some recalibration there. Some have actually now um, cease that particular piece of work in order to re reallocate the funding internally, but also to build out the app with more um, logical user requirements into system requirements rather than just knee jerking and just getting the first white label thing they, they could do. So they're actually just taking a step backwards to take a step forward there. The Digital Futures Cohort Group uh, scored six percentage points higher here with more joined up experiences, SEO uh, investment and, and app use. So again, that would link back to the increase uh, in revenue and operational efficiencies and savings because they're, they're actually collecting more data to actually inform their business processes. Accessibility and inclusion and satisfaction, the final one here. In accessibility, inclusion and satisfaction, um, operators say they're more, they're, they're more inviting to those new to the to new to the sector than last year, but accessibility sadly still 
uh, there's still some accessibility gaps that have grown with fewer providing alternative means to digital engagement. So again, myself and Adam uh, are going to be focusing on this this year and working more closely with our um, accessibility and uh, EDI counterparts within our representative organisations to look at how digital can support that. So uh, we're getting some good case studies with some working groups in this area, uh, which we'll start to publish as we go through this year with use cases. Again, Digital Futures cohort group scored 7% higher here with greater inclusivity and accessibility measures in place, which is which is excellent. So again, this is where we just got to bring out these use cases on any of these plus points within the particular um, consultation, because um, use cases, as we know, are few and far between. We've always been asking for them. They've been hard to get, but we're now putting together in 23, 24, a mechanism to do that. Um, so that then will help inform various different organisations to pull together business cases with some, some ROIs behind it. Recommendations, just very quickly. Um, again, these are all within the report. I know it says 12 and there's not 12 there. Um, Ex-military guy, typical. Um, but some of the key things there, lack of, you know, we need still to support in organizations creating a digital strategy. We've been asked to deliver one ourselves. We've been reticent to do that because they need to do it themselves based on the needs of their organization. We did a paper as part of the outputs from 21, but we feel that now as a digital futures cohort group that we now need to put a little bit more of a spine to allow them to then put the flesh on, on the side of it. So that, again, that's going to be some piece of work that we're going to be doing this year. It's all well and good, um, you know, creating a digital strategy, but if you don't have the data and insight from your consumers, then how do you then build upon it? So ongoing, this piece of work, um, we will be working across the sector now to bring these, the, all the various different NPS scores and, and, and also building out our quarterly. So every quarter we do uh, about 19,000 uh, consumers using leisure facilities. Uh, we tended last year with the company and we started our first one just before Christmas. So every quarter we'll be doing this across the sector and we're going to have the opportunity to put in one or two questions into that based on digital needs. So again, my ask would be to the organization, if there's any particular questions you feel that we should be asking, let's put them into a question bank and then we can start to sign off and rotate and start to provide, provide that data back. Personalization, again, yes, huge, huge amount. There's a lot of stuff in the retail sector on this, which we're leaning on with, uh, with some of the work that we're doing alongside retail to bring some of that personalization and the, the nuances again within it and how they do it and what are the, the benefits of it? What's the behavior mechanics behind it all? So again, that's, uh, that's a focus for us. And we're doing a couple of talks on that this year. Digital skills and mindsets, again, that's, um, that's a huge, huge area. It will always be ongoing. Um, Adam and myself got a passion around this, hence the reason why we did, did uh, the charity skills and we used the Lloyds to really build, bring that out. Because at no point, again, you can only build a, and effectively uh, um, uh, implement a digital strategy, which give you the returns you want if you've got the skills in order to design, deliver. But that's not at C-suite, that's across the organization from the first interaction all the way through to the uh, to the board itself. So we've got some plans to work closer with Sinspera on that uh, as part of our work as we develop out the programme this year. And then we've uh, also looked at other organisations on digital leadership itself. But that's an area which there's a plethora of, uh, of organisations for us to le lean on. Working with local authorities, I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, we've got some great opportunities. We've seen some great use cases where COVID allowed organizations to come closer together to survive and some of those have continued and we've seen some great evidence of how that's actually benefited both local authority delivering on its on its kpis and its objectives but also actually performing the revenue of the operators which those two together ultimately then supports the the enhanced consumer experience because the enhanced consumer experience has driven the increase in revenue and supported with the kpis um, working with platforms, yeah, they were really surprised both years, year on year, the large platforms to say, here, you are stopping us from actually developing uh, with the complexity or the, um, the the age of the technology, the lack of API integration and so on and so forth. So they, they've taken that on the chin and uh, we're doing some very close work with them now on how they can actually support that. Uh, benefits of sharing, greater collaboration, both in intellect, design, uh, case studies and even revenue so we're looking at doing some some work in this area here on bringing greater collaboration across the sector uh, and getting companies a, a scale in there and like we say to every organization and i'd ask you to do the same 
ask your organizations you deal with to to do the online um uh, evaluation because there's only if we uh, get that data in would we be able to start to build out on some of these things so 23 is a big ask to everyone in this room and and everyone who works within the leisure sector to, to drive engagement this this year and uh, and I'll finish there. So a lot of stuff that we we talked about. Um, I wasn't sure if I'm in 20 minutes or not 20 minutes. I'm sorry, I, I tend to babble a bit. But um, we're open to, to questions for a few minutes. And I'll let Tim orchestrate the rest of the session and uh, say you've got one minute for questions or two minutes for questions. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Thank you for that's, that's great thank you very much david yeah no, no worries about the time at all that was that was really interesting i think really useful for, for everyone to see those sorts of um insights and really valuable to have that um just uh before i open the floor to question i think we've already had one or two come through the chat um so i think i think there will definitely be some questions um but just before opening the floor um i, I wondered if uh, adam if there's any extra context you wanted to add around sort of sport england's involvement in this and and any kind of plans that i think dave touched on about maybe extending this to to other areas in the sector oh yeah thanks tim i mean uh yeah thank you dave did a great job talking through all the data there and um i was thinking uh, nice nice to see the scotland data in there given the uh, six nations result the other weekend you know nice to see something <laughs> go the other way for us um yeah, but, yeah, uh, i enjoyed that yeah. um but yeah, no, I think it's I think it's really powerful, you know, to see to see that sort of uh, only 40 40 percent of the of this sample of the sector we're using open data. That's broadly open data, so not specifically open active open data. But um, I think that was quite insightful. I think another in, insight that particularly landed with me was um, that ninety one percent of the operators believe that digital does improve physical activity. You know, that's quite a kind of ringing endorsement of of, of all this work we're trying to do. Um, but then I guess something that was was kind of evident in the fact that people struggle to realise it was that I think only about half of them had an up to, had like a, a digital strategy, really. Um, so we're still kind of and this is where this kind of data. So an organisation be able to do a a kind of self-reflection or, or a kind of like it's almost like a bit of a mini audit as to where they are within the sector. It kind of then helps write the case for how they change, how they might change their structure, how they might invest time and effort into improving their digital capabilities and hopefully you know using things like open data or open active in our in this case um so i think it's a really powerful report you know this is just the second year of it and this year uh, it's going to be bigger and better um you know we're obviously looking at the leisure sector again because they are heavily digital but we're trying to um just make the the, the tool itself a little bit more inclusive of other organizations across the sector because uh, there was a few NGVs and a couple of active partnerships that submitted data into the last tool, even though the wording was more nuanced towards a, a leisure centre style facility. Uh, so that would be great if we can open it out. And if there's a big enough sample size, then we'd be able to see things like public, private, university, active partnerships, NGVs, which would be fascinating because I don't think we've ever really done that across the sector. Um, Pre pre pandemic, we did do a bit of a smaller block of work with active partnerships and NGBs uh, through a contract with Seven League, uh, and they did a little mini barometer as part of doing that work. Um, but that kind of work, although it was interesting at the time, was was more kind of digital commercial kind of angle, and um, you know a short a short term project really for 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 exploration purposes. So to have a tool like this that's sector wide and that we can do year on year, we can benchmark the data and build our understanding both internally in our own organizations which is just for us to know for you know it's, it's closed you know it's personal and kept for that just that organization as well as the aggregated data for people to use as a benchmark for themselves i think is uh yeah it will be really powerful really and hopefully it can help drive drive change great thanks adam that's really useful i, th I think i've seen a couple of questions uh jules from you coming through the chat so i don't know don't know if you just wanted to um to uh, talk about those and i think you you missed just missed the introductions at the beginning so i don't know if you'd mind quickly introducing yourself uh, and your organization and then uh, and then asking your questions uh, uh yes i'm jules from york sport foundation i'm the communication manager i've been having the open active discussions for seven years now i think so it's enjoying the journey uh if we've got 24 percent of people who haven't heard of uh open data we have their email. Is there a muffin basket we can send to say, this is what it is, welcome to the decade kind of thing. And the other one was, it was I think it's just been covered, is how much of this is uh, like the councils and the uh, public leisure facilities and how much is private sector like gyms, et cetera. 
Yeah, it's uh, thank you very much, Nadine. Lovely to meet you, Jules. So if I just go to the last question there. Um, so with regards to the, uh, it is predominantly public sector, although we have had a focus on uh, uh, pushing private. So we've had all the big boys uh, get involved in the private to lend weight and also to our papers. So gym groups, the pure gyms, the fitness first and, and so on and so forth. But uh, we have got within the data set some small, uh, some small sports only locations and sports halls. Uh, we've had a few schools, colleges, universities. However, for us, when we talk about this overall ecosystem of physical activity, leisure and community sport, so we can start breaking it out. Um, that's a big emphasis for us this year. So we need more there. Hence the reason why we're looking to go with, act, you know, extending into active partnerships and to national governing bodies as well and, and yourselves to push through your client bases. With regards to the open data, um, we will be putting, I'm quite keen that we, it's an 80-20 uh, rule when it comes to the consultation. We have 80% of the data will remain the same in order to get benchmarkable. And then 20% we uh, we change to look at, you know, benchmarking against other sectors and so on. Um, we will, as part of this year, be creating a microsites and, uh, and some other uh, uh, assets. And within that will be, when it comes to the triggering of a question around open active open data, then that's when they'll be able to be uh, be fired resources um, around some of the use cases which have been being used and contacts and links and, and so on and so forth. So we're planning to use that as our as our avenue uh, to to expand that as well as all our seminars that we're doing uh, around uh, the UK. And we're actually being asked globally to by a number of countries to, to take this program on with them. So. That is an extension of the, the work that you're, you're doing now as well. Uh, that's useful. Thank you. Someone asked me about uh, NGVs and how many of them have got activity finders, how many open their days. So, and, and I thought, I haven't asked that question in a long while. I just wondered if anyone has actually built anything recently. Uh, so, that's, a good, that. <laughs> uh, that's a good question, Jules. Um, I don't know if there, there's a fixed list, but yeah, there, there's ongoing work and there, there's a, a few kind of... Um, opening all the time and uh, i think uh people like people like tom uh, at the last call um talked about quite a few uh organizations that, that they've been working with um well supporting yeah. we have about 130 system partners that, that yeah. they fund so we're actually having open to get your data open as part of a the funding would be a a really strong push i believe yeah, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Adam. I, I know it is included in the in the system partner agreements, isn't it? But it's it's a sort of fairly light light touch at the moment, isn't it? Rather than a big big heavy stick. Yeah, it's what we're trying to do, um, and actually timely because next week we've got a talk, and actually I think Geraldine, you're joining us on Tuesday next week, looking at the FI list. Um, but that is a talk that kind of gives people an idea of the digital support that's out there, and again, things like open data are within the mix of things we talk about. Um, so it's just trying to onboard people in the right way. You know, like there are quite a lot of different initiatives. We don't want to bombard them with all with everything all at once. We're trying to sort of layer it up, and then gradually get get more and more into yeah particularly things like open data we want people to use it and that's not just open active we want people to make use of things like active play act, um active places which has been around since 2005 believe it or not um and that's an incredible data set of um 1600 um thousand uh, facility points that comes into my my usual other question is it what about an activity so an organization finder because i've open active if an yeah. organization doesn't have an activity it doesn't exist we started building club finders 16 years ago so that appears to be the thing that everything is built on mm. and so there's a constant visibility that seems to be missing in the open active data set mm. well they, they they can ideally um and actually um howard's not on the call but there is some work between the two teams to make sure there is a, a simple kind of uh identifier that's used between the two data sets that allows you to pull the information from both right because i mean that um but yeah these are these are all little <laughs> small steps and there's a similar sort of process to be done potentially with open referral uk i wouldn't know the details of how those, those two things differ right but there's an opportunity there and um Something else very much to be explored is the moving communities data, which is all the data collected from turnstile data. So actually, you could, in theory, have uh, quite a good visibility of what a site has in terms of uh, facilities, particular like access accessibility features, um, you know, like um, pool hoists or, or, or lifts and that kind of stuff. Link that with session data uh, that might be for particular relevant user groups. And then maybe at, at some point look at 
trying to track that through to who turns up and uses through some of that moving communities data. So yeah, we're exploring how to join that up. But um, yeah, Jules, I think I think there's 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 for for some for some organisations in the sector, you know, as you as you've seen on that range of maturity there, just within the leisure operators, um, there's a lot to learn and a lot to learn fast. So we're trying not to scare people away. Um, so we're trying to sort of um, softly, softly onboard people and show people all the opportunities of the things that are out there. And then if there's if people are sort of starting to latch on to open active, then that's when we'll start to bring them into this sort of forum and give them a friendly welcome and help them try and get up to speed with how they can either publish or, or use data. Right. You love a muffin basket. Very good. A muffin basket. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't heard of that term before. But I hadn't uh, either. <laughs> nice. uh, a lure, right. You know, a nice, soft, softly way of bringing them in. Right. Thanks, everyone. Um, did anyone else have any uh, comments or questions for, for Dave or Adam around uh, what's been pre presented today? I'll, I'll happily jump in with one, um, a bit of a bit of a question or, or reflection. Dave, just to echo uh, Adam's thoughts, like really well presented and great to see the, the findings coming out and can really see how that's going to build year three, year four, year five in terms of learning over time. Um, uh, I just want to sort of back the back the thought about extending the, the reach of, of of that report beyond beyond leisure. I think that could be very impactful. Um, I'm almost a little bit, a bit gutted though in, in in the same terms that we're thinking about going to NGBs and active partnerships first, rather than thinking about grassroots operators and activity providers. Um, the reason I say that is I think my experience of working with NGBs probably more so than active partnerships is we all know they don't own facilities and operate activities um, and so when it comes to actually opening that data we need a digital maturity of, of the cohort that actually does that on the ground to to grow so i, I think uh, we i think anecdotally you can see i can see a big difference between a, a, a grassroots commercial operator or goals a power league versus uh and, and in the community especially in the deprived community operator your, your local football coach um and i just love to see us measuring that and knowing what, what i really like about what the report does is is sort of spotlight the areas of concern and give it a year's worth at least of work to try and target and focus on improving those areas. And I think we don't really know a lot of the time with grassroots where we need to be supporting and, and the report, if we were to go and go into those, um, those sorts of communities would help us understand that a lot better. A lot of good work goes on. I think we had that conversation about the work that I'm in and, and Dominic is doing in, in Birmingham, um, but we're not, kind of getting that out at a, at a national level so um really good to see i'd love to see that extension but i'd love to also see it go to those grassroots facility operators um david so if that's right for me to jump in quickly but yeah, also maybe, yeah. to be confused on this as well um charlie i wouldn't say that's off the table right i guess in what we're trying to do first is um change the language so it's not just sort of too leisure center specific but it works for leisure and other and there's no reason why that couldn't also apply to yeah as you've described sort of community grassroots private kind of that that interesting category in there that uh, yeah is, is a is one that we yeah we hadn't really kind of you know we sort of mentioned active partnerships and ngbs and hadn't really kind of considered that as a bigger bucket i guess reaching them is something that like i guess something like a sport england or maybe like uk active doesn't have that kind of familiarity with that but again but if the if the if the maturity tool is worded in the right way and, and wouldn't kind of jar with how they see the, how they operate and, and would add value to that to that kind of area of the sector would welcome uh thoughts from you in terms of how to how to reach that kind of end of the sector and just circulate this and then again if there's enough if there's enough data points that come in that can give a meaningful kind of um category then there's no harm in sharing it but obviously if we only get two or three you know it's, it becomes quite personalized and the data isn't really represent you know it's not a representative sample of that kind of category um but yeah we'll work on that what, what, what did you you know obviously people lots of people have different kind of terms for bucketing of, of organizations what what was the term that you'd use specifically again was it grassroots community and you're not just referring to just clubs within ngbs you're referring to like commercial grassroots leagues and stuff right so like a power league being the yeah example. it's it's your reflection as one i had myself which um is if you, if likes uk active were to and um listen to a criticism it's a reflection go look to extend their own reach of that report you'd, you'd naturally hit the independent um independent studio and independent sort of fitness instructor market quite very easily because that represent a big cohort of the uk active uh, membership um the problem is it, that market the market we're talking about grassroots and community is that's my best capsule to, to for the fragmentation that sits underneath um uh ngbs would be a good route to the affiliated and mem member clubs 
active partnerships that have a very good site of the, of the sort of on the ground uh, local activity providers, charities, um, uh, more so than necessarily the clubs, um, but there's still lots of fragmentation underneath. I think in terms of the role I would see NGBs and active partnerships playing of the tool once it's the wording of it has evolved would be more of a distribution role, because if we can sort of wel welcome those those um, community operators or activity providers or clubs to come and sort of self-test self and use the tool on a self-service capacity. They'll hopefully use it as a learning tool and we're going to be gathering the data from, from above. So um, uh, rather than surveying them themselves, but I, I mean, I've done a lot of work on the provider side and the facility operator side now looking at who those markets are. So we've got sites, we've got general sites of that, um, happily to try and extrapolate that into, into pots and who could help distribute, I imagine. Yeah, indeed. The, uh, the, the, there's already an existing uh, maturity tool which Adam has used um, for NGBs and active partnerships. So from a point of view of the, 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 the effort and the lifting power which needs to be done is, is minimal um, on to bring the two together. For grassroots, we we'll probably have to do a, a more, um, you know, more detailed scoping work on what is um, relevant to them. However, there, there's no issue in you know we're running the consultation june to july from point of view external comms but it's available all the time and and if organizations here want to use the tool and and drive it into your your grassroots just to see what sort of data is coming back out and then we will share that with you we know we're not going to hide anything it's uh, and if it's significant enough then it's either an independent piece of work uh, or report which will be available or it will fall into the main digital uh, maturity report in in november um so it, it, it's there to be used for the sector uh, i think that's really exciting i think it's also like not to put a dampener on it but there's a case of the evolution that report is probably way more than wording you know if you go to a grassroots or community operator activity provider speaking to them about a digital strategy that's not it's not suitable they probably they would never get to that place um, when they're as small as they are so it's thinking about what we're what we'd be measuring when we're going in and measuring digital maturity again organ operational model it might be one person so operational yeah. models not going to be not going to be suitable so, but I think starting up thinking now means over the next two or three years, we might, we might get there. Thank you. Yeah, just conscious of time. So um, I just maybe, uh, maybe there's a one or two more things to, to quickly cover off on the agenda, but I'll just maybe for the last minute or so, I happily take a, a question from, from anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to speak yet. If there, if there are any more um, just quickly before moving on. Cool. Okay. No worries. In which case, um, I'll just move on quickly then to cover off. Um, there's a couple of uh, events that have taken place over the last couple of weeks to, um, just update on. I think would be would be useful to let everyone know that they've been going on. So the first one was a, a panel session that ran at an event called the State of Open Conference, um, and that was actually chaired by Andrew, who we're very lucky to have on the call. So I don't know if Andrew, if you could just um, quickly in, in a couple of minutes, just summarize how that went and, and what that was all about. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so I don't know why my camera's so dark. It's, it's a bit odd. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, last week was the State of Open Conference. It was uh, convened by an organization called Open UK. <laughs> Uh, and I think their aim was to uh, kind of join up the discussion around uh, open hardware, open software and open data. Um, it, it was a really big event uh, in the QE2 conference centre in, in Westminster in London. Uh, I think there were a, a couple of thousand delegates over the over the two days of the conference. Um, and uh, the Open Data Institute curated the, the open data track of the conference. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, as part of that was we hosted a panel session uh, talking about open active and its potential to transform people's lives. Um, we the, the panel I, I chaired the panel myself, uh, and we had Jade Cation from uh, London Sport, Alison from Sport England, and Nick from IMIN on the on the panel, and we had a really interesting discussion about what open active is um how it's developed um over the last uh well, well since 2016 uh, uh and uh what their thoughts were on where it should be going next um the panel session is available to watch on the uh open uk youtube feed 
Um, I can provide a link to that if people want it. Um, and at the moment, there's one big video of the whole open track, so you can watch the whole open track, uh, or or you can just uh, search for it until you find uh, someone you recognise and, and listen to them speaking about open active. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I've got a link. I'll dig it out and post it in the chat. Um, so yeah, it was it was a good conference. I, I think we had good coverage. The, the the questions from the audience were interesting. Um, I think it was well received. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. And um, I'll happily share that link round after the call. And if uh, anyone is watching the recording, then um, just look down below in the description. And I'll, I'll make sure to put the link in, in there as well. Um, so I'll just quickly cover off um, another one that took place earlier this week. And uh, I, I was um, invited, uh, glad to um, to attend a session of the Simsford Digital Marketing Hub. Um, they run, I think it's weekly webinars um, and London Sport were involved with them. And so I, I um, co-presented a session alongside Chris Norfield from London Sport um, uh, around open data and open active and, and how that can be used to support uh, grassroots clubs that some of the ones that Charlie was talking about with, the, with their um, with them online marketing and their digital marketing. And um, so, yeah, went really well. I think there was around 25 to 30 people attended the call and for people who are signed up and registered on the digital marketing hub, um, there'll be a recording and, and a blog a accompanying blog post as well that, that Chris Norfield put together and um, with a minimal support from, from me and David. So uh, uh, at the ODI, so we won't take any credit for that. I'll give that, give that all to Chris um, at London sport, but yeah, worth, worth a look through that. Um, I don't know if Adam is, I think it's free to register for the digital marketing hub, isn't it? And I don't know if um, you yeah, can summarize what that so. is for for <laughs> quickly as a as a Sport England uh, thing, just for anyone who's not familiar with it. Yeah, so um, you can you can sign up via the website. I'll put the web link in the um, chat in a sec. But you can also download it from the Google Play Store and Apple App Store. So it's um, it's run off for a platform platform called Mighty Networks, but it, it looks all curated and looks just like a a, a bespoke product uh, for the for the marketing hub. And it is, it's a learning platform, so you can learn from others. So there's lots of really great content put in there, but there's lots of um, community functionality in there as well. So lots of other marketers will be sharing their insight and posing questions. So it's quite a sort of dynamic community to, to learn from um, if you're trying to improve how you market and promote your activities. So again, hats off to you, Tim, for, uh, for, for getting involved. And, you know, by what, what we're actually doing with Open Active is we're being quite creative with creating a new marketing channel. Um, and potentially one in the future that, that will bypass all the pay for ads that you have to fight against in the other social media platforms. So, um, so you know, it's good to sort of wave the flag for Open Active in there, Tim. So well done. Yeah, no, I, th I think it was good. And, and yeah, always good to to advertise for other channels and, and reach new people. So, yeah, really positive. Um, so we're just into the last few minutes of the call. I don't know if anyone has any questions either for myself or Andrew on those those couple of things, or if um, anyone has any other business they would like to raise in the last couple of minutes. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask how engagement at the Early School Facilities Conference went. Uh, yes, it was good, thank you. I don't know how much I can say about it, to be honest, because... Uh, they they're still um you know not not uh openly talking about it, that you know they're all still embargoed i'm not sure <laughs> so i don't know how much i can say but um yes i will find out and yeah well definitely planning to talk about that at a future aef if uh if possible oh bomb thing uh while i'm here has anyone found out if uh, Parkrun want to be open? I know some. I've seen some stuff put on in Leicestershire, but that seems to be a local pilot. Yes, there's there's nothing as yet with the uh, the national or international. I don't. I'm not exactly sure how Parkrun are, are structured, but yeah, lots of us are working on that and trying trying to get in touch with them and, and trying to um, work with them to to get them to. But at the moment, it's sort big of big muffin basket. Big muffin basket. Yes, yeah. I think might might need a big one, big one to uh, to push them over the edge. But yeah, that, lots of us are are working um, or trying trying to work on that. So yeah, ho hopefully 
hopefully we'll get there in the, in the not too distant future but yeah that the, at the moment it's just i think lots of um local organizations and, and active partnerships in certain areas have been working with them to to kind of get those local leaders to add, add their sessions but yeah no, nothing in, on a national national front yet this right, is why they don't let me have a gun at work because otherwise i'd have sorted that out in a, very yeah. quickly I, I did notice that they were kind of commercializing their data a little bit so uh one of their sponsors i uh, i think it's brooks running have built a kind of park run finder on their website so it's so a park run are clearly using their activity data to, to feed their kind of sponsorship model which is quite interesting great we're just hitting time so i'll open it up for one more point or one more question or one more thought if anyone has it or if not i'll uh, i'll bring the meeting to a close Okay, well, well, thank you very much, everyone, and, and thanks to, to, to Dave for the presentation today. That was really useful and, gr and great to have you on the call. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and taking the time to uh, give us that update, because I think that's been really, really valuable and really useful. Um, and thank you to the new people, uh, Ross um, in particular, uh, who I think uh, is the, the newbie on the call. So thank you for joining us and, and hope to see you again. Hope you found it valuable and interesting. Hope, hope to see you again. And yeah, looking looking forward to hearing a bit more about the work you've been doing in in a, a few weeks time at an upcoming AEF, um, and look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks time. We're, we're due to have um, someone from uh, MCR Active talking about their project at, at the next meeting, so um, that should be really really interesting to hear that. So hope to see you all there, and uh, have a good weekend, everyone.